Famous musicians, Oscar-winning actors, legendary sports figures, and even war heroes all have one thing in common. It all must come to an end. I'm your host, Ed Doyle, and these are stories of fame and fate. In the world of entertainment and the arts, in days long past, right up to today, we've labeled many artists with terms such as good, better, best, and the greats. Some of them came from famous bloodlines. Others came from money, which would open doors with their influence. But some of them came from poor families that had to struggle to survive and fight and claw their way to get anywhere in the entertainment world. Does one circumstance outweigh the other on just how famous a person will be? Some say it's just a matter of who wants it more, who's hungrier, and who's just not satisfied of being another face in the crowd. In this tale of fame and fate, we bring you someone that absolutely fits the latter description. A very poor childhood, difficult family life, and struggles as a young man that would make anybody want to give up. But through all of this, and all of his hard work, and all of his persistence, he became the great one, Mr. Jackie Gleason. The great one, as he was named later in life by actor Orson Welles, was born in Bushwick, Brooklyn, New York on February 26, 1916. His father, Herbert Walton Gleason, and his mother, May Agnes Gleason, both from Courtney Cork, Ireland, Jackie Gleason and his brother all lived in a poor neighborhood in a rented flat at 328 Chauncey Street in Brooklyn. Jackie was originally named Herbert Walton Gleason Jr., but later was baptized as John Herbert Gleason. It was a very poor family, and his mother worked as a subway change booth attendant and his father as an insurance auditor. Then at only three years old, Jackie's only brother, Clements Gleason, died at 14 years old from spinal meningitis. Jackie Gleason attended elementary school at PS 73 in Brooklyn. He was not a model student, and he was often accused of being very disruptive in class. His only concerns at the time was playing stickball, hanging out in pool halls, and playing pranks. Jackie was actually caught spreading Limburger cheese on the radiators at PS 73 so that way the school would have to be dismissed for the day, as janitors would have to seek out and clean the fall smell. And though never proven, some say it was Jackie Gleason that also released a snake in the orchestra pit at the Hazley Theater. Jackie later went to John Adams High School in Queens, then to Brunswick High School in Brooklyn where he actually would meet his first wife, Genevieve Halford. But less than a year later, Jackie would call it quits. He said that school was an obstacle that he had to overcome. So Jackie Gleason never graduated. Jackie Gleason knew what he wanted though in life. He had once said that when he was a very young boy, his father took him to a vaudeville show and after one of the acts had finished, Jackie stood up, looked at the audience that was laughing and applauding, and he said he knew right then and there that this was the only view he would ever have the rest of his life facing an applauding audience. Jackie did everything to make money in his young life from hustling pool, boxing and amateur bouts, and entertaining in cabarets and small nightclubs. At only eight years old, 
living in their poor Chauncey Street apartment, Jackie's father walked out on him and his mother. They struggled to survive with only his mother's almost non-existent income. Jackie had said that though there was a lot of love in the flat, it was a dismal place, sparsely furnished and a dim light bulb hanging from the kitchen ceiling. Jackie did what he could to help his mother by tidying up around the apartment as she worked long hours to barely pay the rent and feed them. At age 19, Jackie Gleason's mother, Mae Gleason, died. Jackie Gleason was penniless. He managed to scrape up subway fare and would move into a small apartment with two roommates that were also young thespians. During the depression, alone in life, with his father gone and his mother dead, Jackie was determined to become the greatest. With unemployment at its worst, Jackie still managed to keep steady work. He didn't make much money at all, but he kept working. He became the house comic at the Empire Theater, but his salary was so bad that many times his day's meal would only be cafeteria soup, which is hot water in a bowl mixed with as many free condiments as you can muster up. Jackie Gleason would continue working clubs in Jersey and Brooklyn and was lucky enough to land gigs in bigger venues in Philadelphia and Long Island. He was known as someone that wasn't afraid to stand up for himself and in fact at one show while performing in Newark he was being continually heckled by a man in the audience. Jackie actually stopped the show. He told the audience he would be right back, walked down to the man and said, you, come with me. Both men walked outside, but the next thing Jackie knew, he was waking up on the ground with people fanning and throwing water on him to help him come to. Jackie asked, who was that? Well, it was none other than heavyweight boxer, two-ton Tony Galanto. In 1936, Jackie reunited with his high school sweetheart and they were married and honeymooned right where he got his first steady job, the Empire Theater. Now striving for fame and fortune and now having to support a wife, Jackie landed roles in Broadway shows called Along Fifth Avenue and Keep Off the Grass with stars like Ray Bolger, the Scarecrow from The Wizard of Oz and Jimmy Durante. Each night after the show, though, he would hustle over the 52nd Street to perform in clubs till 2 or 3 in the morning. He never tired. He was always striving to be better. Jackie Gleason would be lucky enough to be seen by Jack Warner of Warner Brothers Pictures. After seeing Jackie perform a few times, Warner finally approached Jackie and offered him a contract with Warner Brothers Pictures. As excited as he was to get what he thought was his big break, Jackie Gleason's first movie experiences were far from great. He had bit roles in the movies Navy Blue, starring Ann Sheridan and Jack Oakey, where he played the role of Tubby. He would get the role of Hobart in Lostney Incorporated and Stachy in the movie All Through the Night. But Jackie did not shine in the eyes of critics, nor in the eyes of the management of Warner Brothers. As quick as it started, Jackie Gleason's movie career came to a screeching halt as Warner Brothers refused to renew his contract. It was even written by one of his critics that the fat man would never make it. Bitter at Hollywood, Jackie would return to New York and go back to playing in clubs and trying to land Broadway shows. By 1941, with no certain future, Jackie and his wife Genevieve now had two children, Geraldine and Linda. With his family growing, Jackie Gleason was even more determined to succeed. He won pots in Broadway shows and started to get rave reviews for his performances and his personality. Then in 1949, 
Jackie Gleason would be offered the role of Chester A. Riley for the debut of the television version of the famed radio show, The Life of Riley. Before it became a hit though, Gleason quit the show, saying he could do better things and went back to his nightclub acts. The TV series, The Life of Riley, long after Gleason quit, would become a television hit. His nightclub shows, however, were getting noticed by many in the industry. And finally, he caught the attention of a small new television network, the Dumont Television Network. Jackie Gleason would be offered a contract to host the Dumont Network's new star television show, The Cavalcade of Stars Variety Show. Jackie Gleason would be the splash for the show, singing, dancing, and comedy. It was here that Jackie would develop some of his most unforgettable characters that he would carry through his life, such as Reginald Van Gleason III, a full of himself, troublemaking, insult throwing son of a well off family, and the poor soul, a poor guy that could never catch a break, but never spoke a word, and Joe the bartender. In one of the episodes, Gleason played in a skit as a New York City bus driver named Ralph Cramden, married to a wife named Alice. The skit turned out to be one of the most memorable and successful skits of the show, and later would embed Jackie Gleason into the hearts of America when the skit became the television show, The Honeymooners. In 1951, CBS would steal Jackie Gleason from the Dumont Network and he was given his own show, The Jackie Gleason Show. He had a staff of over 160 members in the form of actors, dancers, musicians, June Taylor of the June Taylor Dances. There were crew, wardrobe, and makeup staff like you couldn't believe. The Jackie Gleason Show would take over the airwaves and Jackie would become known as Mr. Saturday Night. In 1955, with that oh-so-praised skit from the Cavalcade of Stars variety show still in the minds of producers, CBS decided they would split Jackie's time slot into two half-hour shows, The Jackie Gleason Show and The Honeymooners. Starring Jackie Gleason as Ralph Cramden, Audrey Meadows as his wife Alice, Art Connie as the bumbling but lovable sewer worker and Ralph's best friend Ed Norton, and Joyce Randolph, Ed Norton's wife Trixie. The Honeymooners would become America's number two show in its first season. It would come into the living rooms of America and hit the hearts of audiences because they could identify with the cast making light and comedy of the trials and tribulations of a hard working family only trying to succeed. The Honeymooners would go on to produce 39 episodes before it ended and actually grew in fame and popularity later years in reruns. An odd fact about the Honeymooners was that Art Connie and Audrey Meadows both would receive awards for their performances on the show but Jackie Gleason was never even nominated for his starring role as Ralph Cramden. Jackie Gleason couldn't read, write, or play a single note of music, but he would make millions off his made-up melodies. He would go on to record 43 albums of mood music, and at one time, hold the record which still stands to this day for Billboard's top 10 at 153 straight weeks with his first album Music for Love Is Only. During his career Jackie and his wife Genevieve grew more and more apart. As time went on Jackie Gleason spending all of his time in Hollywood and Genevieve spending all her time in New York with their two daughters Finally, Genevieve had enough and she obtained a legal separation in 1954 in the uncontested charge of abandonment by Jackie Gleason. 
However, because of Genevieve's deep, devoted Catholic beliefs, she refused to divorce Jackie Gleason. Finally, in 1970, Jackie Gleason was able to file for divorce because of a new law that went into effect stating that grounds for divorce could be legal separation of a couple for more than two years. Jackie Gleason and Genevieve Gleason divorced. Jackie Gleason met his second wife, Beverly McKittrick, working at a country club where she worked as a secretary. Not 10 days after his divorce from Genevieve Halford, Gleason and McKittrick were married in England on July 4th, 1970. But in 1974, Gleason again filed for divorce from McKittrick, who contested this time asking for reconciliation. The divorce was granted on November 19th in 1975. Jackie would continue with guest performances on television and star in specials. And he would party like there was no tomorrow. Perhaps it was because as a child and a young man, Jackie Gleason struggled to call anything his own or even have a dime to his name. But he would now make up for that by indulging in everything that life had to offer. He had an insatiable appetite, always a drink in one hand and a cigarette in the other. Jackie Gleason celebrated life to its fullest. In 1975, Jackie would fall in love with the sister of June Taylor, Marilyn Taylor. They had actually met many years earlier while Jackie and Genevieve were separated. But Marilyn had said in an interview that nothing came of it because she didn't want to be the other woman. So after 25 years since they first ever met, Marilyn would receive a phone call. It was Jackie Gleason, right from the courthouse immediately following the finalizing of his divorce. He called her and said, Marilyn, there is a single man on his way to see you. Not long after, Jackie and Marilyn were wed. In 1978, his overindulgence caught up with him. After years of overeating, smoking, and drinking, he was admitted into the hospital and underwent a six-hour triple bypass. In an interview some years later, Jackie confessed that even though he should have learned his lesson, it was actually two days after the operation that he had talked the nurse into bringing him a cigarette. She would continue to bring him one a day, and he would hastily puff down the cigarette while she waited outside of the room. Although through the 60s, Jackie Gleason would star in several movies such as The Hustler, playing the unforgettable role of Minnesota Fats, Papa's Delicate Condition, how to Commit Marriage, and several more movies. It wouldn't be until the 70s and 80s that Jackie Gleason would once again enter the hearts of America. Some of Jackie's most memorable movies were The Toy, co-starring Richard Pryor, the movie Mr. Billion, The Sting 2, and perhaps his most memorable role of all times, as Sheriff Buford T. Justice in Smokey and the Bandit 1 and 2. It was in Smokey and the Bandit 2 that Gleason actually decided to bring back a couple of his old characters from way back in his television years. And he not only portrayed the part of Buford T. Justice in the movie, but also played the parts of his law enforcement brothers, Gaylord Justice and Reginald Van Justice. In 1986, at age 70, while Jackie Gleason was filming his last movie, Nothing in Common, with his co-star Tom Hanks, Jackie Gleason was diagnosed with colon cancer, which eventually 
spread to his liver. And on the day of June 24th, 1987, at only 71 years old at his home in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, Jackie Gleason passed away, according to his wife Marilyn, silently and comfortably. As his life was lived large and magnificently, so is his final resting place. Here in Doral, Florida, at Our Lady of Mercy Cemetery, lies Jackie Gleason. In a final resting place with a shrine that celebrates how wonderful Jackie Gleason's life was and how well he lived it. And as in Gleason's showmanship style, the way that he lived life, if you look closely, you'll see inscribed on one of the bottom steps, and away we go.